Welcome to Israel Now News. I'm Yochanan El Rome. And I'm Rebecca Rand. In our top story, Israeli embassies and Jewish communities around the world are on high alert following the assassination of Iran's chief nuclear scientist, Mohsen Fakhrizadeh. Jerusalem has remained tight-lipped about the execution of the mastermind of Tehran's rogue nuclear program, but the Israeli media reported that his death has deprived the radical Islamic country of an irreplaceable source of knowledge. The European Union described the killing as a criminal act, and while it could not directly blame the Jewish state, the notoriously anti-Israel body said the killing runs counter to the principle of respect for human life the EU stands for. Israeli opposition leader Yair Lapid responded, saying, the fact that the EU is condemning the justified assassination of the Iranian nuclear scientist, instead of condemning Iran's efforts to acquire weapons of mass destruction and their involvement in terrorism all over the world, represents moral bankruptcy and abject cowardice. An Israeli delegation traveled to Khartoum to solidify ties with Sudan, which was one of three Muslim countries to recently normalize ties with the Jewish state. The Abraham Accords, brokered by U.S. President Donald Trump, have already yielded cooperation between Israel, the United Arab Emirates, and Bahrain. The Trump administration remains adamant that Israel and moderate Arab countries can live in peace and combat the common threat of Iran and its dangerous nuclear program. A delegation from the White House, including the president's son-in-law, senior advisor Jared Kushner, was recently in Saudi Arabia discussing the advancement of ties between Riyadh and Jerusalem. This comes only one week after a landmark visit by Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to the Saudi Royal Kingdom, where he met with Royal Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman and U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. The central European nation of Slovenia has declared Hezbollah a criminal and terrorist organization. The government in Ljubljana announced that Hezbollah's activities are intertwined with organized crime and terrorist or paramilitary activities on a global scale. According to Israel's foreign ministry, 16 countries in the last 18 months have designated Hezbollah in its entirety as a terrorist organization. A statement released by the U.S. State Department said the continued announcements by countries in Europe, Latin America, and other regions of actions against the terrorist organization send a strong message to Hezbollah and its backers in Iran that Hezbollah will no longer be able to operate from European soil. The State Department also joined calls from Israel for the European Union to close loopholes opened by the false distinction between the terror group's so-called military wing and its political apparatus. Israel's Minister of Aliyah and Absorption has flown to Ethiopia to prepare for the imminent arrival of 2000 Falash Mura. Pnina Tamano Shata and the head of the Jewish agency Isaac Herzog will initially be accompanying 500 new Ethiopian immigrants back to Israel. The remaining 1,500 are set to arrive in January. In the 1980s and 90s, Israel airlifted 22,000 Ethiopian Jews from Africa back to their historic homeland, but thousands of members of the Beta Israel community, known as Falash Mura, remained in Ethiopia. This group claims distant Jewish lineage. Many of them were forcibly converted to Christianity in the 19th century, but later returned to Judaism. They have been waiting in camps in Gandhar and Addis Ababa for Israel to approve their immigration. Jerusalem has been working to expedite the aliyah of the remaining members of this community in light of the deteriorating health, security, and economic conditions in Ethiopia. Karen Ayasod is working feverishly to raise the funds to bring these 2,000 Ethiopians back home to Israel. Six Israeli tech firms were named in Time Magazine's 100 Best Inventions of 2020. The publication explained that every year it highlights innovative ideas that are making the world better and even a bit more fun. The six Israeli companies honored in the list of global groundbreaking inventions were BeeWise, which makes smart homes for honeybees during a time when 40% of the world's bee population is dying off. Trialjectory uses smart software to match eligible patients with appropriate clinical trials. Augmetics utilizes an X-ray vision headset to turn CT scans into 3D images to guide spinal surgeons during procedures. MyFold, the company that developed a compact, foldable booster seat, was also recognized. 
as was Dumatoke's Incredible Sugar, which allows bakers and food companies to reduce sugar content up to 50% while retaining the same level of sweetness. And last but certainly not least is City Transformer, the folding electric car which can retract its wheels to a width of one meter when not in use, making it so small that four of these vehicles can fit into one standard parking spot. The Israeli developed oral insulin medication Oramed is in its final stages of testing. The product began phase three trials with the FDA last week after 14 years of development. If everything goes as scheduled, Oramed will become the first oral insulin available on the international market. Nadav Kidron, the CEO of Oramed, said that this medication has the potential to improve the lives of hundreds of millions of diabetics worldwide. Israeli athletes have taken the European Championships by storm and are bringing a slew of gold and silver medals home to the Jewish state. Three Israeli windsurfers captured medals. In the men's competition, Yoav Cohen won first place and Shahar Tsuberi took the silver medal. Among women competitors, Israeli Kati Spachikov won the silver medal. The Jewish state's rhythmic gymnastics team took the gold in the group all-around category, and 21-year-old Israeli rhythmic gymnast Lenoy Ashram won the gold in Kiev, Ukraine. Israel's men's basketball team beat Spain 95-87 in a qualifying game for the International Basketball Association's EuroBasket 2022 tournament, placing Israel in a prime position to make it to the quadrennial competition. This comes just one week after Israel's Peter Palchik won first place at the 2020 European Judo Championships. A young boy from Jerusalem discovered a golden bead which was likely lost on the Temple Mount 3,000 years ago. In 1999, the Muslim Walk, which controls the holiest site in Judaism, illegally dug up thousands of years of history and archaeology from underneath the Temple Mount and dumped it as garbage into the Kidron Valley. Israeli authorities took possession of the artifact-rich earth and have been painstakingly searching through it one barrel at a time. The Temple Mount Sifting Project, which is open to the public, has yielded some of the most exciting archaeological finds, including this 3,000-year-old golden bead discovered by nine-year-old Benjamin Milt. The Israel Allies Foundation has announced the launch of its 46th Parliamentary Israel Allies Caucus. This one is in the Czech Republic. The IAF is a network dedicated to promoting communication between parliamentarians and legislators around the world in order to mobilize faith-based support for Israel. Josh Reinstein, the president of the Israel Allies Foundation, welcomed the organization's newest member and said he hopes to have 50 parliamentary Israel Allies caucuses by the end of the year. He believes that faith-based diplomacy is the secret ingredient to the strong support which Israel now enjoys across the globe. Reinstein stressed that we must continue to expand and develop this network in order to translate the widespread biblical support of Israel into real political action. We are living in mysterious yet miraculous times. We've witnessed the most remarkable fulfillment of biblical prophecy, the Jewish people's return to Israel, and the prosperity and contributions of this tiny country in such a short time. Yet we've also seen an unexpected rise in anti-Semitism, which takes the form of anti-Zionism, and alliances between groups that are fighting against the most fundamental biblical values. In the book, Titus, Trump, and the Triumph of Israel, Josh Reinstein answers important questions to clarify what has driven political action from the time that the Roman Emperor Titus destroyed Jerusalem until today, when President Trump recognized Jerusalem as Israel's capital. Get your copy today and learn how faith-based diplomacy has changed the world. To order your advanced copy, go to triumphofisrael.com. That concludes the news portion of our show. Stay tuned for Ask the Source with Josh Reinstein.
Hello and welcome to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein, and we're here in our beautiful studio in Jerusalem. My guest today is Eugene Kontorovich. He's a professor of international law at the George Mason Law School. Eugene, thank you for being on the show. Hey, great to be here. Well, you're known as one of the top international law when it comes to the boycott, divestment, and sanction movement. Please tell us a little bit about what is BDS? A boycott, divestment, and sanctions is a current trendy name for a very ancient practice of economic warfare and discrimination against Jews. Uh, it's the idea of not buying products, Jewish products, and egging others on and trying to create a hostile economic climate where people won't trade with Jews. Now today, this of course is directed where most Jews live, at the Jewish state. So the Nazis also had a boycott uh, of Jewish goods, uh, but now that most Jews are living in Israel, that's the place that's targeted for boycotts. Uh, it has a long history. It goes da back to the Arab League boycott. When Israel was created, all the Arab countries announced a complete boycott of Israel. Today, that's been picked up by progressives, rebranded as BDS, but it's the same thing. A lot of people say that it's the same as traditional anti-Semitism. They just replaced the word Jew with Israel. Uh, is that true? Yes, so Israel has become uh, the world's Jew. And I think it's quite clear that uh, if you adopt a policy, policies to the, country, to the country where most of the world's Jews live, where the, overwhelming, um, uh, the only country where the majority of the population is Jewish, those, those policies are a proxy for anti-Semitism. America has taken a big stand against this. We saw uh, legislation that uh, you were involved in in 32 states. How was that effective in stopping uh, financial BDS? So we have, a, we have legislation in 30 states now, and what, those, what those, that, that legislation says is that uh, boycotting companies or people because of their connection to Israel is a form of discrimination. And if it's a form of discrimination, the state, the state government, won't do business with people who discriminate. Just like the state won't do business with people who discriminate on the basis of race or gender, if you're discriminating on the base of someone's connection to Israel, you won't be eligible for government contracts, government investments, uh, and so, it, uh, and mo more importantly, it just sends a clear message that we see that this is no different from any other kind of invidious discrimination. Uh, unfortunately, Europe has taken a complete different uh, direction on this issue. They, in fact, are doubling down on boycotting on Israel and including uh, regulations now where they have to label goods from Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, and the Golan Heights. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, Europe has uh, an extraordinary set of rules. Uh, where they have a unique product labeling system that applies solely to Jewish-owned go uh, goods, to Jew solely to Jewish-made goods, uh, where normally you write on a product the name of the country, made in Israel, made in China, whatever. For products from Judea and Samaria, uh, Jerusalem, uh, they require that it be written made in occupied Palestinian territory, which is not a country, Israeli settlement product. In other words, something about who made it. They're saying, you need to say, this was made by Jews. Now, there's no other context where a product origin label needs to say where it's from. You don't say, made in Chinese prison labor camp number 23 by slave labor. So this is a, a rule just for Jews, and we've seen this before. It's a yellow star on Jewish products. Now, you mentioned before that the progressive movement is pushing BDS. Uh, you see it always uh, being presented as, you know, a freedom movement, universal rights. A lot of Jews are involved in it, yet it always ends up with really harsh anti-Semitism and, and, and really anti-Israel sentiment. Where is this all coming from? Uh, I think the progressive movement, um, and in particular the uh, critical race theories, uh, which are now so much at its heart, have an inherent problem with Jews. Because uh, part of the idea of critical race theory, which is supposedly anti-racist, is in fact very racist, because it says everything depends on your identity and your history of oppression. And uh, the, the longer your history of oppression, the worse you have it and the more um, reparative, uh, restorative justice you need. Um, Jews have the longest history of uh, oppression of any people in the world, and perhaps the worst. Uh, yet uh, you see, instead of competing on the history of their victimhood, they compete on their accomplishments. That's an inherent problem for uh, critical race studies. R critical race studies also says that, uh, uh, theory also says that everything is based on your racial identity. Jews are a tribe which is not defined by racial identity. 
There's black Druze and white Druze. There's uh, amongst the Druze, there's many different shades of color. And Druze don't think of themselves in terms of the shades of their color. Um, even amongst Ashkenazim, wide varieties of pigmentation. We see pigmentation is not how we relate to each other. That's a massive refutation of their um, pigmentation-heavy uh, theories. Uh, and finally, uh, Jews are, Jews believe that like, there's a particular truth, uh, the Torah that God gave to the Jews, uh, and the Jews are a particular people. And uh, that is at great odds with the universalism of modern progressivism. So why are we seeing so many Jewish figures involved in the progressive movement? We see Bernie Sanders and George Soros and people who identify as Jewish. Why are they funding and supporting this movement? I don't think there's going to be any room or much room for Jews in the next generation of the progressive movement, which is the uh, critical race theory, heavily driven uh, movement. I think um, they're going to really squeeze them out. Uh, the people you mentioned, George Soros and uh, Bernie Sanders, are from an older generation of progressives where progressivism was principally an economic issue, right? That is to say, socialism, rights to workers, about changing the um, distribution of money in society, basically. Um, and that used to be central to the, um, to the progressive narrative. That narrative has been completely changed uh, um, by, uh, today. And people like Bernie Sanders and uh, George Soros, they're just trying to keep up. But they're really, I think, going to be, to be benched. I think, indeed, that was one of the uh, problems Bernie Sanders has. He couldn't really fully appeal to progressives that he was a r racial, not just an economic uh, progressive. Uh, well, it seems that the BDS movement is, is a complete failure. I mean, we just saw the uh, Abrahamic covenants. We're seeing uh, nations come closer to Israel. There's like a nine-month waiting list for heads of state just to meet with Pre Prime Minister Netanyahu. Um, have they gained any ground uh, recently? Uh, they haven't gained any ground, but they believe in their, they've actually, so and, uh, as you've mentioned, uh, you know, the Abraham Accords have opened up trade with the Gulf states in unprecedented ways, and they're not checking if it's from Judea and Samaria. They're importing wine from Golan Heights now, it can be sold in the UAE, and it can't be sold in Europe. So we're, at a, we're in a place where um, you're better as a Jew selling to uh, Arab states in the Gulf than European countries, you're going to get less discrimination. But I think that has to do with this idea that the BDS is a deep ideology, and they can suffer lots of setbacks because they're not in a hurry. They believe history is on their side. They believe that they have, and the moral arc of history is in their favor. And for four years, I think also BDS has been on hold, sort of, because uh, of the Trump administration. Uh, so one of the things they're hoping is eventually they're going to get a political atmosphere in America more favorable to them, and then we can see these efforts by Europeans and NGOs really redoubled. How long do you think this mask of anti-Israel or anti-Zionism is going to hold? I see already in Europe the, the same rallies where they'd say, you know, death to Israel, or once again just saying death to Jews. Um, well, that's correct, but I think uh, it's important for them to have um, compartmentalization. You're going to have people saying death to Jews uh, uh, at anti-Israel rallies, uh, and those are going to be the scary, the scary people. And regular uh, BDS activists are going to say, talk to us. You know, deal, you're going to have to deal with us so you don't deal with the, the, really, the really crazy people. They, they will always be portrayed as a, uh, as a lunatic fringe because for um, the movement to boycott Israel, so much depends on their marketing as a human rights movement. And until the media really start questioning this, so far they've been parroting this, um, whenever you hear uh, in the press reference to BDS, it says, BDS, which is a grassroots-led movement inspired by the Palestinian struggle against settlements, which is not what it is. Um, but until there's real pushback on who these people are, many of the BDS groups have links with terror organizations, but that's not how they're described in the press. Eugene, there are literally tens of millions of people watching this show. What message do you have for our viewing audience? Israel is a country uh, surrounded by hostile neighbors. Uh, fortunately, the neighborhood has gotten better. But the hostility that is coming from Europe uh, is always going to remain. That's why Israel depends now more than ever on Americans, Christian Americans, patriotic Americans, to counterbalance the increasing malign tendencies from other Western countries. Thank you, Eugene, for being on the show, and thank you for tuning in to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein. Now back to the studio. Up next, the return to Zion with Karen Hayasod.
Shalom and welcome to the Return to Zion with Karen Hayesod. I'm Sam Grundwerg, World Chairman of Karen Hayesod, the leading official fundraising organization for the State of Israel. Even before the creation of the State of Israel, Karen Hayesod worked with the Friends of Israel to bring home our sons and daughters. Watch this amazing story about how together we saved the Jewish community from Iraq. In 1947, the United Nations took a historic vote to establish a Jewish state. But Jews who had lived peacefully for centuries in neighboring Arab countries became a target for violent retribution, especially the 150,000 proud Jews of Iraq. In response, the Zionist movement launched its most daring operation. Shlomo Hillel, who would later become an Israeli government minister and world chairman of Karen Hayesod UIA, was recruited to plan an operation which would save Iraqi Jews and bring them back to their ancient homeland. תבוא מחר אל חיפה, ישנם שני טייסים אמריקנים שהיו גיבורי מלחמה במלחמת העולם השנייה והם שמעו שהם יכולים פה להציע את השירות שלהם לגמרי תכליתיים, אפשר לנסוע לבגדד, יש מקומות במדבר לחנות אני אומר, כל עיראק זה מדבר אחד גדול, אוקיי, אז בוא ניסע הכביש שיוצא מבגדד, מצד אחד יש בו שדה התעופה, מצד שני מחנה צבאי גדול. כלומר, כשאני פה צריך להיזהר מאוד, יש גדר בכל שדה התעופה, אז ראינו באיזה מקום שהגדר קצת חלשה. באמת מגיע המטוס, מתחיל להניע את הפרופלורים ברעש נורא ואיום, מדליק את הפרוז'קטורים כדי לעוור את, ה- את המגדל הפיקוח שבתוך שדה התעופה. The pilots then took off and aimed the nose of their Curtis Commando aircraft westward, home to Zion. As we arrived at the airport of the airport of Baghdad, it was a very good feeling of peace and peace. But the truth is that this is not the end. They were able to hold one another in their hands, and we are going to the Golan Valley, and suddenly, אני רואה את הכנרת, כחול, ואני כבר רואה מרחוק את יבניאל, ורואה שתי מדורות, ואז ישר הטייס, בלי לעשות סיבובים, בין שתי המדורות האלה נוחת. Within minutes, the new immigrants had been spirited away to local communities, many pioneered by Karen Hayesod to begin their new lives in the home of their ancestors. From 1951 to 1952, around 120,000 were flown to Israel in operations Ezra and Nehemiah, named after the biblical prophets of ancient Babylon. With the help of Karen Hayesod, these immigrants built new lives. They became leaders of Israeli industry, politics, and the military. Operation Michaelberg also demonstrated that Jews would return to Zion, whatever the circumstances. As the Jewish state celebrates its 70th year, Israel can be proud that time and again, it has plucked Jews from danger to safety. All of this can be tracked back to Shlomo Hillel and two brave American pilots. Today, many more Jews dream of returning to their homeland to play their own part in the miracle which is the state of Israel. Karen Hayesod is at the heart of these efforts. Jeremiah promised, your children will return to their borders. Let's bless Israel together. Now's the time for you to get involved. Assist Karen Hayesod to raise the necessary funds in order to bring Jews yearning for their homeland back to Israel. Your donation can help fulfill the biblical prophecy today. To donate and get information, visit our website at www.khisrael.org.
Lift up your eyes and look around. All your children gather and come to you. The biblical prophecy is unfolding right before our very eyes. The people of Israel are returning to the Promised Land after 2,000 years of exile. But millions of Jews are still longing to come home. Anti-Semitism threatens many of the Jews. We must rescue them before the window of opportunity slams shut. Bless Israel by supporting Karen Hayasod United Israel Appeal, the leading official fundraising organization for the State of Israel. Together, we can fulfill the prophecy of the Bible. Let's bless Israel together. To donate and get information, visit our website at www.khisrael.org. I want to wish His Highness Crown Prince Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed and all the citizens of the United Arab Emirates, our new friends, a very joyous national day. Since the signing of the historic peace treaty between us, Israel-UAE relations have been moving ahead rapidly, quicker than we anticipated, in fact at breakneck speed. We're cooperating in so many fields, in science and technology, in commerce and investments, in healthcare and education, in transportation and tourism. In these and so many other areas, our partnership is bringing tangible benefits to both our peoples. The fruits of peace are at hand. So when the UAE succeeds, Israel succeeds. And when Israel succeeds, the UAE succeeds. May our new partnership be an example to all nations of the Middle East. Together, we're building a better future for our two countries, for the region, and for the world. Happy National Day. May God bless all of you. Lift up your eyes and look around. All your children gather and come to you. The biblical prophecy is unfolding right before our very eyes. The people of Israel are returning to the Promised Land after 2,000 years of exile. But millions of Jews are still longing to come home. Anti-Semitism threatens many of the Jews. We must rescue them before the window of opportunity slams shut. Bless Israel by supporting Karen Hayasod United Israel Appeal, the leading official fundraising organization for the State of Israel. Together, we can fulfill the prophecy of the Bible. Let's bless Israel together. To donate and get information, visit our website at www.khisrael.org. And that's all for this edition of Israel Now News. I'm Yochanan El Rome. And I'm Rebecca Rand reporting from our studio in Jerusalem. Please join us again next week for all of your Israel updates. <laughs>